Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. Uh, I have so much affection for Gare and the Jones family, and so you're just kind of all lumped in with that. So a lot of love to you. You know, I don't know if I should say this, but when pastors get together offline, it's a little bit like the dynamic when parents get together. There's a, there's a high probability of some griping about the kids, if that makes sense. You kind of just emotionally discharge, whatever. And you should know that when he speaks of you, he speaks so highly of you. With, uh, when nobody is there to listen, no performance, just such love and affection and respect for you. So you must be pretty great or he is in denial. I'm about to, <laughs> I'm about to find out, but it's great to be with you. Please turn in your Bibles, if you have one, to Mark chapter nine. Mark chapter nine. And when you are there, Stand with me for the reading of scripture. I know you were just up, but the normal guy will be back next week. (laughs) Mark chapter nine, let's pick it up in verse 14. But first, let me just curate a moment in the quiet for you, however you want, to open your heart and your inner life to the God who is deeper in you than you are in yourself. Mark chapter nine, verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us. Help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit, you deaf and mute spirit. He said, I command you, come out of him, never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Go ahead and sit down. In Michael O'Brien's novel, The Island of the World, there's an interaction between the protagonist, who is this Bosnian man named Joseph, living under communist Yugoslavia, and this mysterious stranger who's kind of new to the story, who's kind of like an angel type of figure. And the unnamed angel type of figure says this. In your life, Joseph, you will have much to fear. In time, you will come to a length of days and wisdom and goodness. You will suffer, and this suffering will bring much good to others. I do not understand what you are saying. You do not need to understand. Only remember, you will be afraid, but do not be afraid. What can this mean? Tell me what it means. You will be afraid, but when you are afraid, do not be afraid. I am 42 years old, let the record state, and I am essentially living through a freely chosen midlife crisis. (laughs) After, um, right on cue, 
after just shy of about 20 years church planting and pastoring up in Portland, Oregon, as Gary said, I stepped down from the lead pastor role to start a nonprofit. My family and I just relocated to California where we are originally from, but uh, it's a long story, short version. We're doing kind of a family gap year not far from here with our mentors who are like second parents to discern and kind of figure out where to put down roots for our second half. There's more to it than that. That's the short version. Point, as you can imagine, pretty much any fear that could come up in my heart has come up in my heart. Fear is the anticipation of evil. And at one level, God designed a fear impulse into our neurobiology, I think, as an act of love to keep you and me and our bodies safe from harm. I mean, studies have been done on those on the other side of traumatic brain injury who have lost the kind of mental capacity for fear. And this, it's, that sounds wonderful. The stories are not of bliss, but of misery. And whether you ascribe to Christian theology and Jesus' view of the world or evolutionary biology or some mishmash of the two, it's no secret that something has gone deeply wrong in our body's relationship to fear. We're far beyond our autonomic nervous system saber-tooth tither reflex. And I have come to believe that fear is at the root of almost all of our problems in the spiritual life. Why? Because the telos, or the end goal of the spiritual journey as defined by Jesus, is to become a person of love as defined by Jesus. Through union with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as we enter into the inner life of the Trinity and we experience their love poured out through Christ and by the Spirit into the deepest part of who we are, we are transformed over a long period of time into people who are also pervaded by love and then can't help but share that love with the world. That's the journey of discipleship behind Jesus. And, you know, it's written in the New Testament. I'm thinking of John's famous line in his letters, there is no fear in love. And he goes on, because perfect love, the kind of love that we see on display in Jesus of Nazareth, casts out all fear. And my theory on, on this juxtaposition between fear and love is as long as we need our life to go a certain way, right? And fear is when like our plan for our life, our desire for our life, our intentions for our life is under threat. What do we feel? Oh no. As long as we need at an emotional level our life to go a certain way, we will, despite our best intentions, and most of us have them, we will act in ways that are unloving to anyone or anything who gets in our way. Therefore, fear, again, at some level, is at the root of all sin. And faith is, at some point, the ultimate solution. <clears throat> Early on in the pandemic, remember that? Um, <laughs> someone in the American South coined the phrase faith over fear, which became a rally cry in the US for a kind of anti-lockdown movement and as a result became kind of more polarizing language in the culture wars. Now, you may hate that phrase, you may have it on your bumper sticker outside. Who am I to judge? I'm, well, I'm judgmental, but <laughs> I'm not supposed to be. No, I don't have a cat in the game. That's between you <coughs> and Gare. I'm not <laughs> referring to where you fall on the left-right spectrum, but to how far along you are in your spiritual journey with Jesus. The Catholic theologian and psychologist Benedict Rochelle summarized the entirety of the spiritual journey in Jesus as a decrease in fear and an increase in faith as a lifelong, slow, incremental, decade over decade shift from what Jesus called in the Sermon on the Mount, anxious care or worry, to a deep, genuine, peaceful trust in God. And that's essentially what faith is, trust. The word uh, faith in the New Testament in Greek is this word pistis, can you say that? And it's one of a kind of constellation of Greek words in the New Testaments that, that fall into what linguists call a semantic domain, kind of just the same basic idea or range of meaning. Words like faith, belief, trust, confidence, reliance, allegiance, and faithfulness. All these words in the New Testament orbit around a kind of axis point or center that is the word faith, which is best defined as confidence grounded in reality 
which is different than how most Americans uh, imagine faith. Faith, for example, and I'm thinking of New Testament theology here, is not a blind leap into the dark, contrary to popular opinion. It's not believing something for which there is no evidence, but believing something based on evidence. As the Quaker Elton Trueblood, who was the chaplain at Stanford for many years, as well as a philosopher, as he once said, faith is not belief without proof, but trust without reservations. Faith is neither, neither is faith a feeling Though it has an emotional component to it. When you have faith, when you trust someone or something, you're at peace. And finally, faith is certainly not just mental assent, which was kind of the fatal flaw of the Protestant Reformation, if you know your church history, which redefines saving faith as believing the right doctrines about God. And while believing the right ideas about God is utterly essential, faith is more than just what's in your mind. Faith is an action. It is something you do. You put your faith in God, in the language of the New Testament writers. And faith is at the center of our discipleship to Jesus and all Christian spirituality, to the point we call our worldview the Christian what? Faith, a practice dating all the way back to the New Testament itself, where Paul uh, writes to the Ephesians about the one faith and writes to Timothy, keep the faith. And the first thing you need to understand about faith is that it isn't a religious thing, it's a human thing. We all live by faith. It is impossible not to. Again, faith is the sense of trust or reliance on someone or something to get you where you need to go or to do what you need to do. A silly example, I have faith that this stage will bear my weight. Now, I have not been underneath the stage with a contractor, smart person, who knows what size the posts need to be and if this thing's to code or if it was done by Christians who don't do whatever. I don't know, you know, church people, never know. I've not been down there, but I have a general trust in the moral caliber of this church and Gary was up here and Ash was up here and I'm likely going to be okay. Now, if I had no faith, I never would have come up here in the first place. I would stand down on the floor. If I had weak faith, I would come up, but I would like, stay over here right in the edge, ready to jump off so I don't get hurt. But since I am full of faith, I'm a man of faith, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm just up here doing what I need to do because I have faith, I trust the stage to hold me up. I have faith that my car will start after church and get me to lunch spot to meet Gare. I have faith that Gare, because of our friendship, will show up and not abandon me in LA. I have, I have faith that my debit card will work to get gas and the way I'm, you get the picture. I'm living by faith. So are you, all of us are. Whether you are an apprentice of Jesus, or a Buddhist, or a Hindu, or an atheist, or a seeker, or a mishmash. Even, and not just with stage and your debit card, even at the met, pop up to the meta level of meaning and purpose in life, the question is not, do you have faith? It's who or what do you put your faith in? Jesus, or Richard Dawkins, and one particular interpretation Apparently, there's something wrong, I'm so sorry. And that interpretation of the data points of science, or your influencer of choice, or your friend group, or just your own intuition and street smarts. Here's the Christian philosopher James K.A. Smith. The question isn't whether you're going to believe, but who. It's not merely about what to believe, but who to entrust yourself to. Do you really want to trust yourself? Do we really think humanity is our best bet? Do we really think we are the answer to our problems, we who've generated all of them? (laughs) He said it, not me. (laughs) Hence, the invitation of Jesus is to believe, is to put our faith in him, in all of him, not just his death, his life his teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospels about him, the miracle stories, his death on your behalf, on mine, his burial, his resurrection by the power of God, his ascension and his return to one day make all things new, to live in trust and reliance and confidence on him. Now, I'm guessing that many of you are not there yet. One of the things I regularly hear from people that are not yet followers of Jesus but are at some level drawn to him in the heart, just not, can't get there yet, is I just wish I had your faith. 
But here's the thing. Faith isn't something you have or don't have. It is something you grow in over time. Faith in Christian theology is one of what the theologians call the theological virtues, along with hope and love. They call it that because theological, because it has to do and doesn't make sense apart from God or theos. And virtue, meaning, again, faith is not just a feeling. It is the kind of person you become. It's the shape of your inner woman or man. As you apprentice under Jesus, you become more and more over time a person of faith, a person with a growing sense of trust in God. And faith, just like any virtue, per, uh, patience or wisdom or fortitude, whatever, must be developed. Faith is like a muscle. We grow it through a kind of resistance training. Think of a baby or an infant just out of the womb. We all start weak in faith. None of us come out with like six pack abs and like bench pressing our own weight. We can't even sit up. We have so little faith. And every obstacle we face to trust in God is a chance to work out our faith muscle and grow stronger and mature. We see this in very mature disciples of Jesus. Like, do you know anyone in their 80s or 90s who has been following Jesus well before you were alive? As a general rule, they tend to be the most joyful, peaceful, at ease in their own bodies, grounded people you will ever know. You really saw it through the pandemic. Everyone under 40, you could just describe as freaking out. <laughs> Everyone over about 75 who was a Christian, just calm, at peace. Some of the best people you will ever meet because they live with this unshakable bedrock confidence that everything will be okay even if everything is not okay. They, over many decades, have traveled the spiritual journey with Jesus from fear to faith. Now, what is the landscape of such a journey? That's where I wanna go with you this morning. I'm a firm believer in what I like to call spiritual cartography, which is just a pretentious attempt to, to map the spiritual journey over the arc of a lifetime. It's the Christian analog to what psychologists would call stage theory. For an apprentice of Jesus, the goal of such an exercise is to plot yourself on a map, not to compare or contrast, but to better name the warnings and invitations of Jesus to you at your point in the journey. To that end, let me offer you a map for the development of faith. You could call this three levels of faith, though they're not levels that you ever mature beyond or out of, but you know, Californians love to level up, so let's go with it. This paradigm is not chapter and verse. It's definitely not from Mark 9 right here. Mark 9 is an example of one level. But I would argue that you could overlay it over pretty much any biopic in Scripture. Job, if we had time, Moses, David, Paul, and many others. Level one is what I would call the faith of religion. This is Job at the beginning of his story, if you've read it, or Paul on the road to Damascus. It's where all of us start, the faith of religion. The word religion gets a bad rap. It's used by a lot of Christians over the last few decades as a polemic against a particular kind of religion that is heavy on rules and light on relationship. Hence the kind of Christianese, it's not a religion, it's a relationship, which sounds nice, but it's not really honest. Religion is best defined as a set of beliefs that explain what life is all about, who we are, how we got here, and how we should live going forward. By this definition, all people are religious. Again, you can't not be. Your religion may be something called Christianity, or it may be Islam, or Christian science, or very likely the last few decades in our country, politics, or social justice, or football, or your career is a massive one, in particular in cities, or your family, you name it. But in discipleship to Jesus, the faith of religion is essentially a way of relating to God that is based on quid pro quo, meaning if I fill in the blank, then God will fill in the blank. If I put my faith in Jesus, then God, I will go to the good place when I die. If I tithe, then God will bless me financially. If I don't have sex before marriage, then God will bless me with a great spouse. In evangelicalism, the catchphrase for this first level of faith is biblical principles for living, which are great, just for the record, I'm all for biblical principles for living. 
But left unchecked, they can become an attempt to use God and insider knowledge of the way he wired the universe to flourish as just another attempt to engineer the circumstances of your life to your desired end. Just another human attempt to minimize pain and maximize pleasure, but minus the Nietzsche part, more with Christianity. This is Book of Proverbs level faith. Again, it's not bad, it's just the beginning. Most people don't realize that contrary to the novelist Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, there was very little controversy around the canonization of scripture because early on there was a wide consensus for both what we call the Old Testament and the New of which books had that special quality as well as very stringent criteria. But few Christians today know that one of the most hotly detested, uh, debated books that almost did not make it into the canon was the book of Proverbs. Anybody read the book of Proverbs? It's, it's not like an offensive book, right? It's that, like, why did that one almost not make it in? And here's why. If you read Proverbs as a book of general wisdom principles, then it is incredibly insightful. But if you read it as a book of promises from God, then it simply is not true. It's true about 80% of the time. But it's that 20% of the time that will just rob you of faith. Train up a child in the way they shall go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. I hear parents, to cope with their fear, claim that as a promise. But I'm sure there are parents in the room who've done everything humanly possible to train up their child in the way they should go, and now their child wants nothing to do with Jesus at all. The problem is, at some point, this formulaic approach to God will fail you. A crisis will come, and God will not save you from it. Or you will do the right thing, and instead of being rewarded, you will be punished, like Jesus was. Or you will go through a period of pain and suffering with no idea where God is or what he is or is not doing. When that crisis comes, and I'm just the bearer of bad news, I'm so sorry, but it's when, not if. It's only a matter of time. Bless you this morning. Um, <laughs> you, have th you have three basic options, not to oversimplify. Option one is you step back from your faith. Or in more biblical language, you fall away. You just give it up. It's a very complex phenomenon, but this is one of the main causes or drivers behind the kind of millennial cultural trend of what we would call deconstruction. It's because many people, in particular many of my generation in the U.S., never mature beyond the faith of religion, never go beyond this kind of quid pro quo. And just as Jesus said, quote, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Option two is you step aside and you kind of compartmentalize your faith. You put your faith kind of over there at Sunday in church or whatever, and then the rest of your life over here, your career, your job, your life. And as a result, you just kind of live with this dissonance that just drains you of spiritual vitality. This is where nominal Christianity comes from. Option three is you step up to the next level of faith. That is the faith of desperation. This is the faith that's called for in a crisis when the direct intervention of God is your last and only hope. When the diagnosis comes and it is not good or it's even worse. When you get the phone call and it's worst case scenario. When your fears come true. When your prayer is unanswered. When your plan falls apart. When the dream dies. When the relationship is over. When you, have, you just are forced to admit it's a failure. In what some would call the dark night of the soul. It's the story we just read right here in Mark 9. This man is at a breaking point. His son is demonized. He's exhausted every possible solution. He has no control. The biblical principle of train up a child in the way they should go, which is true and right, but it is no longer cutting it. His only hope is a miracle from God. So what does he do? He goes to Jesus. He does not have strong faith, but he goes with the little that he has. Look again at verse 22. Um, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And then I love Jesus' reply. If you can, dot, 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 ellipsis, way before there was text messaging. <laughs> Everything is possible for the one who believes. See how Jesus is just gently 
coaxing the man up to a higher level of faith in the power of God and the possibility of life in the kingdom of God. You see, as uncomfortable as I am with this next thing, and you likely are too, I don't, let's just be honest. There is a reciprocal relationship between our level of faith and the release of God's power in and through our life. Uh, John Wimber used to say, faith is spelled R-I-S-K, meaning you have to risk. You have to step out in faith if you want to see God's power manifest. This man is risking heartache, yet another wave of disappointment, social stigma, things getting worse. He's risking all of it in the faith of desperation. Some of you are at this point right here this morning, just at the breaking point. Maybe you have strong faith. Maybe you are more like the man in the story, which is how I often feel, in particular living inside the era of secularism, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Or that can be translated, I do have faith, I do trust you, but help me overcome my lack of faith and my lack of trust. In this story, there is a happy ending. The boy is set free, and I, just pr I pray genuinely for the same release of God's power over your life this morning. But before we're done, just one more. What if the boy wasn't set free? I'm not trying to mess with scripture, but just hypothetical scenario. What if his story ended like Jesus' story, where in his crisis he prayed, Father, take this cup from me, and heaven was silent, and the cup was put right before him. And a few hours later on the cross, he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me from Psalm 22? and the sky went black. You see, there's an even higher level of faith than the faith of desperation, which is a bit easy to miss, in particular in the charismatic stream of the church, of which you and I are kind of both a part, because there is so much emphasis on stirring up faith to believe in God for the miraculous, which is wonderful, it's beautiful. But it's easy to miss, there's actually a higher level of faith than believing God for the miraculous. That is what I would call the faith of surrender. This is where you aren't believing in God for any particular outcome. You are believing, just, you're just believing in God. It's Jesus at the pinnacle of spiritual maturity. What did he say right after, let this cup pass from me? He said, not my will, but what? Yours be done. It's Job at the end of his story. My eyes have seen the Lord, now I repent in dust and ashes. End. He goes silent. No more questions, no more demands. You are God, I'm not. I don't get it. End. It's Paul in prison waiting for a verdict from Rome that will either set him free or behead him. What does he say? For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, that will do great good for you. If not, better to be with the Lord by far. And then he writes, my only prayer is that Christ may be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Amen. Oh, that's all. Not, I believe that God will rescue me from Rome. I believe that Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Now, this doesn't mean, let me just nuance this a little bit, that you don't have desires for a particular outcome. All of us do. All of us desire to minimize pain and maximize pleasure. Good luck with that. That's like, I'm working hard at that. I hope you are too. It works really well until it doesn't work anymore. So it doesn't mean that you don't have desires for a happy life. It means you're not emotionally attached to those desires. See, the struggle with what um, some would call attachment, I love that word, you may not like it, so just listen with me for a minute. The struggle with attachment is at the root of all of our fear. It's like the ball and chain that is holding us in prison and away from freedom in God. As the saying goes, our anxieties reveal our attachments, meaning whatever it is that we worry about, that we toss and turn on our bed about, that we ruminate in our mind on, it tends to reveal the things that we feel and think we need to be happy, what Thomas Keating called our emotional programs for happiness. 
The Indian uh, Jesuit writer Anthony DeMillo said it this way, if you look carefully, you will see that there is one thing that causes all unhappiness. The name of that thing is an attachment. What is an attachment? An emotional state of clinging caused by the belief that without some particular thing or some person, you cannot be happy. So your attachment is not desire. Listen carefully here. It is an emotional state of clinging to a desire. It's not wanting something. It's needing something to be okay. Our attachments, or um, if you prefer in more kind of reformed Christian language, our idols promise us peace and happiness, but what do they actually deliver? Anxiety and misery. Because all of our attachments can and at some point will be stripped away. If not by a crisis or a global pandemic or a recession or a disease or a diagnosis, nothing else than by old age and death. Everything that we cling to, that we want and feel we need, at some point, it will pass. The paradox of Jesus' teaching, and I'm thinking especially here of the Sermon on the Mount, but really all through the Gospels, is as long as you need your life to go a certain way to be happy and at peace, you will never be happy and at peace. Therefore, one way to think of the spiritual journey in Jesus is as a slow burning off of our attachments to all that is not God. The final state of spiritual formation or discipleship is what ancient Christians called apatheia. It's a Greek word that's hard to translate into English. Uh, it can be translated peace or serenity. It's again, think of the 80 year old. It's that calm, tranquil, tranquil face. It's that luminous kind of inner radiance of joy no matter what that you see only in the most mature disciples of Jesus. Another way to translate apatheia is detachment, which think of detachment as the opposite of attachment, not an emotional clinging, but an emotional letting go. And this is very important, and forgive the nuance here, but detachment in the way of Jesus is very different from in Buddhism, which is where most of that language comes from in a city like LA, where the aim is the negation of all desire, in Christian spirituality, it's the reordering of our desire onto, to seek first the kingdom of God, onto life with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Desire in Christian thought is not a bad thing. It's like the engine of our life that is driving us forward. The problem is not that we desire, it's that our desires are out of whack. We either want the wrong things or we want the right things in the wrong order. Dr. Mulholland, uh, Robert Mulholland, defined detachment as, and I love this, a deep inner posture of joyful release of our life and being to God. In absolute trust, without demands, without conditions, and without reservation. It is neither a passive resignation nor a fatalistic acquiescence to whatever comes. It is rather a consistent posture of actively turning our whole being to God so that God's presence, purpose, and power can be released through our lives into all situations. St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, he called this indifference, but of course, uh, you know, he was writing in Spanish, and so a number of people think a better translation is the English word freedom, where you reach a state in your journey with Jesus where you are free of the emotional need for things to go a certain way, and you are just with Jesus in the kingdom of love, and you are okay. He said this, one of his most famous lines, he called this his first principle, we should not fix our desires on health or sickness, wealth or or poverty, success or failure, a long life or a short one. For everything has the potential of calling forth in us a deeper response to our life in God. Our only desire and our one choice should be this. I want and I choose what better leads to God deepening his life in me. Now, that is so beautiful. Just for the record, I am not there yet. I'm not even, like, close. I'm like where there's a, you know, like you're driving I-5 to Canada. I'm like where you see the first sign of it, but you're like 700 miles away still, <laughs> right? 
But that, that's where we're going with Jesus. Nothing summarizes this better than St. Teresa of Avila's prayer. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing make you afraid. All things pass, but God is unchanging. Patience is enough for everything. You who have God lack nothing. God alone is sufficient. That's called her bookmark prayer because when she died, they found it in her writing in a bookmark in her Bible. She would just come back to this day after day. This, if you want to call it apatheia or detachment or freedom or pe whatever you want to call it, it is the ability to hold the reality of your life right before your mind, no denial, no escapism, right there, and be grateful, content, and at peace in God. This, this is the highest level of faith. Not faith that everything will work out great, but that no matter what happens, even if, God forbid, and we pray against this, all of our worst fears come true, even then, we don't need to be afraid. Jesus is with us. That doesn't take away the pain and the suffering, but we are not alone, and we do not need to be afraid. And he will make all things beautiful in his time if we only surrender and walk through this moment as it is. So to recap, you have the faith of religion, the faith of desperation, and the faith of surrender. Now really fast, before I let you go, how do we mature in our faith? Wherever you plot yourself on that journey, and again, it's not linear, right? But you might have an area of your life where your faith is high and another area of your life where your faith is weak, right? I was just doing this wacky thing with the psychologist that Gary and I know, who's mapping my sub-personalities. Don't judge me for it, it was, <laughs> it was helpful. And he mapped one as a part of me, like does what I'm doing right now as another one. And he said, oh, that part of you is an atheist. That part of you doesn't even believe in God. <laughs> so apparently I have serious need of therapy and all sorts of things. But if you're there and you're like, okay, how do I go forward? How do I mature? Well, we mature, and this is an oversimplification. Go easy on me, I'm a guest. But we mature in two basic ways, through what? earlier generations of Christians called active spirituality and passive spirituality. Now, that's ancient language, not modern, so it sounds off-putting to our kind of ear, but I find it so helpful. By active, spiritual, uh, active spirituality, what they meant by that is areas of our life with Jesus where it feels like we take the initiative. Like, if you don't do it, it won't happen. It is our part in our discipleship and formation. For example, the spiritual disciplines all begin that way such as reading scripture in the morning or coming to church on Sunday. This, yes, was a work of grace, but you got out of bed and you hopefully took a shower or not. We're really happy you're here. And you came, my 17-year-old son is here somewhere. He, I, I doubt it. Um, you came, you did that. You said yes, not to save yourself, but to open up your mind and your body for Jesus to do a deeper work in you. Passive spirituality is where it feels more like God is the one who takes the initiative. It's more God's part in our spiritual formation. And all we can do is either cooperate and surrender and say yes, or resist it and fight it and grow bitter or run away. At an active level, there's a few simple things that we can do to grow in our faith. Number one, step out in faith. Risk a little. What can you trust God for? major or minor? Is there a micro kind of step of faith? Is there something that you feel the Spirit is stirring up in you, a, a kind note to write a coworker or a neighbor or somebody to invite out to lunch? How do you, Willard was once asked, how do you become a saint? And he said, by doing the next right thing. Just do the next thing. Two, practice gratitude. Gratitude is one of the best ways to overcome fear because gratitude is the practice of being present to the goodness of God in the moment Whereas fear is the feeling of anxiety over possible evil in the future. The more grateful you are, as a general rule, the more you realize how good your life is with God and just how true Psalm 23 is. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You grow in your faith. Third, get around people of faith. There is a social dimension to faith. Some social environments, like secular cities, decrease our faith, and others increase it. Jesus said of his home village he could do no great miracles there because of their lack of faith. Living in a city like L.A. is very hard on your faith, but it can be the hardship of a gym. 
I love living in secular cities, not because I'm a secular person. I just, that feeling when you're walking down the sidewalk and it's like almost every single person here thinks I'm nuts. <laughs> not most people around the world, not most people around through history, not, but people here. There is something that I find about that both intellectually stimulating and spiritually invigorating. Every single day is a chance to work out my faith muscle. But it is hard. You will either grow strong in your faith or you will lose it living in LA. So you have to be around people of faith. And I'm preaching to the choir, you're at church, you're here. But you have to be around, get in a social environment. Next, ask God for more faith. Faith is both a muscle that we developed and in biblical theology, it is a gift of God. It's an act of grace. Make the man's prayer your own. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Give me more faith than I have. And finally, just wait. One of the greatest signs that we have faith is the ability to calmly wait for God to move in our life, to wait for his direction, for his hand, for his voice. And waiting itself is a kind of resistance training. So that's pass, uh, active spirituality. But then, really fast, there's passive spirituality, what scripture calls the test of faith. But this isn't a test like in in school or college where you get an answer sheet and you have to like fill in the right answer or wrong. It's more like a stress test where an engineer tests a plane or a car or a software designer tests a new piece of tech or where a blacksmith tests the metal or a chef tests a new dish. It's a way to test the integrity or strength or quality of something to see what it's actually made of. Can it take the strain? Is it ready to go out into the world or not? And it's less for God, the test of faith. He already knows what's in our heart. It's more for us. We often do not know what's in our own heart. But when we are tested, what we actually believe, which is often beyond the access point of our consciousness, what we actually believe then comes to the surface. We may genuinely believe that our identity is in Jesus and it's not in our career until we lose our job or we're unemployed, or we retire, or we change. And then what we actually believe becomes clear to our heart. Our family went through a very painful experience um, this last year. And I have to kind of keep it ambiguous to honor some other parties. But we, we had a dream that we had been praying and working toward for over a decade. And it was coming true. It was a literal dream come true. And we were so excited, it had all sorts of implications for the second half of our life, for our whole family. And at the very last minute, I mean weeks away, uh, out of left field, everything, all of our plans fell through, and unfortunately in a very heartbreaking way. And the dream, the dream, died. And all through the discernment process, multiple years kind of leading up to a decision we made to do something that ended up not happening, all through that process, I would pray almost every single day, Lord, your will be done. And I genuinely thought that I meant that. Until the outcome that I wanted and that I thought God wanted, surely he must agree with me, <laughs> I thought fell through. And when my faith was tested, I realized, oh, I don't actually want whatever God has for me. I want, you know, these 10 options within this kind of, you know, as long as it's within 10 miles of the coast in California, between <laughs> LA and, and Mendocino, as long as it's there, and as long as it's, then I'm open, God, whatever you have <laughs> for me, you know? And when uh, our dream was in jeopardy, I was racked by, I was the most anxious I've been in so many years. And when our dream died, I was grief stricken. And so it's embarrassing for me to admit, but you know, hopefully the mystics are right that the only path to humility is humiliation, <laughs> in which case I am like really growing in humility the last season of my life. But it has called for a whole new level of surrender. Not the surrender of virtue, I sur the surrender of, I don't, have, where else shall I go? You alone have the words of eternal life. But that's what Christian spirituality is all about, right? As we end, 
So how do we cooperate with Jesus in the test of faith if you're in that now? Well, we just surrender. It's very simple. We don't have a lot to do. We just let life be done to us more than we normally would. In a culture where everything is about control, I mean, you live in L.A., everything is about take control of your life. You cannot get through a single Peloton ride without a, like, <laughs> full-on indoctrination and in self-actualization, take control of your life. I mean, you know it's true. Inside that culture, which is futile, which is where anxiety comes from, which is the study I read the other day that says the average American only has 15% of the control over their life they think they do. That 85% is why you have a therapist, hopefully, right? <laughs> In a culture where everything is about control, we give up that illusion. It doesn't mean we just lie around and are irresponsible. You hear me, hear me in context. We surrender. And then secondly, we stay faithful to Jesus. Even in the valley, you keep walking and trust that somewhere out there in the dark and the fog is our good shepherd and he will never leave us and he will never forsake us no matter what we feel at this point in the story of our life. Daniel Berrigan, the Jesuit priest and anti-war activist was once asked, is faith in your head or in your heart? And he said, neither, faith is where your butt's at. Which is a bit cheeky, I know, um, but <laughs> so I'm sorry. He did not actually say but, but I can't quote him in a sermon. And what he was saying was, while what we believe in our mind and we feel in our heart, it's of great importance. Your inner life with God is crucial. Don't mishear me. But at the end of the day, faith is about where your body, faith is about faithfulness. Where is your body? Inside what commitments to Jesus and his people and his way are you living, no matter whether you're on the mountain or the valley or somewhere in between? And it's about trusting Jesus, the good shepherd, to pastor you day over day, knowing that whatever happens, you do not need to be afraid. Let's stand together.